Welcome to this episode of Litigation Briefs, Media Shorts on Law and Courts. I'm Scott Dodson, a distinguished professor of law at UC Hastings College of the Law and the director of the Center for Litigation and Courts, which produces this series. We've all heard stories about a plaintiff who sues for what seems like barely minor injuries, but is awarded a much larger, maybe even shockingly larger sum of money in punitive damages. What are punitive damages? Why do we have them? And should they be reformed? Here to help me with these questions is my guest, Catherine Sharkey, Siegel Family Professor of Regulatory Law and Policy at NYU Law School. Kathy, welcome to the show. Thanks, Scott. It's great to be here. What are punitive damages and what are they for? Yeah, well, punitive damages are awarded in civil cases, so not criminal cases, and they are designed to punish and to deter. So we'll get back to that because it's a little bit cryptic. Is that uh, a single goal or two separate goals? But the basic idea is they are amount of monetary damages that are given above any kinds of compensatory damages that are given specifically for a plaintiff's loss. They tend to be awarded in a subset of cases, cases where the defendant has either acted egregiously and or has done something that has threatened the health and safety of individuals in society. Are punitive damages controversial? They're extremely controversial. They're one, not the only, but they're one of the quote unquote exceptional features of the American uh, civil landscape. Um, exceptional, of course, can be good or bad. They tend to be looked on with some amount of abhorrence from other jurisdictions. So countries outside of the United States look and they ask or wonder, what are we doing by punishing within the civil system? Um, typically, when we think about punishment, at least retributive punishment, we think about the criminal law, not the civil law. So that's one main reason why they're controversial. They're also controversial even within you know, the United States and a culture that might embrace that you can have punishment within a civil system for the reason that you suggested at the outset of the, of the podcast, which is that they tend to seem like they're very large awards that um, aren't related to the amount of loss a particular plaintiff might have suffered and also might see, be seen as a huge windfall to a single plaintiff in one case. What controls then exist on punitive awards? Yeah, there are many controls. So first and foremost, um, there are standards for awarding punitive damages. These vary by state, but typically some states require that the defendant has acted with some kind of malice or willfulness, the kind of typical paradigmatic case that we think of it in, say, an intentional tort, maybe where someone has caused physical harm to someone. Other states, though, and this is where they start becoming more controversial, have a more lenient standard that suggests if they if you act with, quote, reckless indifference to the health and safety of others, you can be subject to punitive damages. But there is some requirement on the part of the defendant to act in a in a way that has um, some level of culpability and or infliction of this kind of widespread harm. Another very important restraint is the US Supreme Court, starting in 1996, basically constitutionalized this field, by which I mean that the US Supreme Court has imposed limits um, and has said that punitive damages can be constitutionally excessive. And they set forth various guideposts to try to direct lower courts in terms of reining in what might be seen as illegitimate punitive damages awards. Can you give a famous example or two of punitive awards? Let's put these into some context. Sure. And maybe I'll start very recently. Within the last week or so, there was a very large jury award given by a um, jury in Georgia. It's a case against Ford Motor Company. Um, two individuals, um, I believe their siblings, brought a lawsuit 
because the pickup truck in which their parents were driving rolled over. And then, and then once it rolled over, the roof collapsed in on and their parents were killed in this accident. So they brought a products liability lawsuit against Ford and the jury first awarded 24 million in compensatory damages, which is quite a large amount in a products liability case. Um, this is a wrongful death um, uh, situation. Uh, on top of that, the jury then came back with $1.7 billion in punitive damages. So that's one example of what you suggested at the outset of the outset at the show can seem like these very large amounts of money seemingly not proportional to the amount of loss in a particular case. What was then the basis for that large award? Was there justification? Yeah, so there was evidence at the trial that um, Ford had known about the um, situation regarding its roofs and had done nothing about it. And so this kind of idea of um, they were quote unquote showing reckless indifference to the health and safety of others in society most likely is what incensed the jury in this case. But you raise a very good question, which is that scholars like myself um, get into arguments about what should the proper purpose of punitive damages be? Should they only be for retributive punishment? Should they also serve, as I have argued, for what I've called a societal deterrence um, purpose, which would mean if, if a company, let's say like Ford, has harmed not only the individual before it, but maybe widespread harm to others, should that be taken into account? And given that we as scholars argue about the proper purposes, we do remarkably little to instruct the jury. The jury is usually just told, give an amount to punish and to deter. It's not usually even told that those could be two separate kinds of goals, that even if you're not punishing an entity, you might nonetheless be trying to incentivize not only the company before you, but other companies who are looking on and seeing what's happening might be incentivized to take further safety precautions. So in that way, they could be having kind of a forward looking goal. One other thing of note in Georgia is that Georgia has the legislature pass what's known as the split recovery statute. And that statute actually gives 75% of a punitive damages award over to the state. And now, again, the legislature hasn't explicitly put forward that there's a kind of societal purpose, but there is a recognition that the amount that you might need Ford or another company that has done widespread harm, the amount you might need to make them pay to internalize these costs and to serve to deter others from not taking safety measures might not be tantamount to the amount that you wanna give a single or small number of plaintiffs in a case. So since you've had a career studying punitive damages, what reforms, if any, might you suggest for them? Yeah, so in my opinion, you know, states really need to do a much better job about articulating what the particular purpose of these awards might be in certain types of cases. So for example, there are state, state legislatures that have added multipliers, right? Three times, four times, five times compensatory damages for particular types of offenses like um, things that are causing consumer protection harm. Uh, there are these unfair trade and deceptive practices acts that do so. Um, that's one example. I think there are others. If a company is engaged in fraud, um, the legislature might come forward and say, that's a kind of case where um, in a particular instance where the company is sued and has to pay compensatory damages, we might want to extract from them supra compensatory, something above and beyond compensatory damages, but we need not call that punitive. I think that the notion of punitive damages is in some sense a misnomer. Yes, these are to punish, but embedded within that, we might have certain instances where what we need to do is really incentivize corporations in particular from taking additional safety measures in instances where they might not be brought into court every time they harm someone. One other just comment on the Georgia situation, it also came to light during the trial 
that Ford had been on notice of numerous other of these rollovers that had harmed other individuals. Moreover, it came to light um, through some of the coverage of the case that this is an instance where there have been a lot of confidential settlements. So confidential settlements are an issue unto themselves, but in this instance, they at least show the idea that there might be a need to further deter not only Ford, but other automobile companies, others looking and making a kind of calculus as to whether to add safety measures, there might be a need to give a kind of kicker through something that we call punitive damages. Well, Kathy, thanks so much for being on the show and talking about punitive damages. Thank you, it was a pleasure to be here. This episode was produced by the Center for Litigation and Courts at UC Hastings College of the Law. If you enjoyed this episode of Litigation Briefs, I hope you'll tune in to future episodes. In fact, I hope you'll consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and audio podcast, which can be accessed through the Center for Litigation and Courts website at sites.ucHastings.edu slash CLC. While you're at it, encourage a friend to do the same. This is Litigation Briefs, respectfully submitted, Scott Dodson.